Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am Re Reverend Vicki Elder, and it is, is my joy and honor to welcome you to Unity of Monterey Bay, a beloved community co-created with love and intention that welcomes all people, all races, ages, cultures, ethnic backgrounds, economic circumstances, nationalities, and religions. Whatever your immigration status, sexual orientation, gender identity, family configuration, and or abilities, whether you're here with us in person or joining us virtually, we know that love has no boundaries. We are one in spirit. As a purpose-driven church, Unity of Monterey Bay is an inclusive spiritual community committed to co-creating an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just, and compassionate human presence on this planet. We celebrate our oneness and honor the God of each of our understanding, affirming the innate good and divine essence within each and every individual. Would you please join me in our statement of faith? There is only one presence and one power in the universe, God the good, expressing as infinite God beyond us, intimate God beside us, inner God being us, divine love in action. As we allow this knowing to deepen within our souls and serve to awaken us into enlightenment for the benefit of all living beings, I share from Glenn Cardi's A Book of Blessings, Blessed Be Doors. Blessed be doors, big ones in blue or round and rainbow or ones that look like you. Blessed be doors that open us in, onto new paths of thought being and acting if we walk through. Blessed be doors that attract no attention, but are there as a pointer to a different way. Blessed be doors that are open when we least expect it, inviting us into a new place, suggesting we stay. 
and blessed are we when we do. And breathing into this moment of inner truth and gratitude, we affirm together, thank you, God, God, for for this this most amazing day. Miracle Miracle follows miracle. And and in this celebration of miracles, we celebrate our children, those in our spiritual community, in our families, in the larger community, and all the children of the world, as well as the inner child within each of us. And... You saw a picture a little earlier in the song yesterday morning. My newest granddaughter, Madison or Maddie, Isabella Elder entered the world. And in the words of her dad, a calm little miracle. (laughs) So after three days of being in the hospital and 55 hours of process, um, she came into the world yesterday morning at 636 and... uh, Everybody's healthy and well, and thank you, God. Yes. You can press the button. There we go. (laughs) So, so as we hold all these children in our hearts, you can go to the next one and get the, uh, the, the affirmation. Please join me in our affirmation. We love you. We bless you. We appreciate you just the way you are. So now let's all take a deep breath in and let it out with an audible sigh. As we set ourselves to embrace this blissful interconnection with spirit and invite the chime to call us into the sacred space within. We ring the chime four times to call in the four directions and remind us of our interconnection with all of creation and with the sacred circle of life. As we feel it resonate through our very beings, we follow its call into this now present moment within. Continuing to focus on our breath, with each inhale, we open our hearts and minds. We envision our breath reaching every cell of our being. And with each exhale, we see all barriers and obstacles dissolving into this divine flow. Again, as we inhale, we expand the spaciousness within us. We move beyond the limitations and boundaries of our bodies. And as we exhale, we ground ourselves deep within Mother Earth and into our oneness with the universe. Finally, we breathe our awareness into the highest expression of love, light, joy, and peace we can imagine as we experience a transforming wave of gratitude. And with a fullness of heart, we say yes to it all, embracing, claiming, and knowing the divine Christ spirit expressing in, through, and as us. And with a final exhale, we say thank you, God. Now fully centered and transformed by the power of spirit, we enter into our lesson and meditation time with today's daily word. We read from today's daily word, shared with permission of Unity Publisher of Daily Word, that can also be found at dailyword.com. In the word is generous. I invite you to allow my words to be your words. The abundance of the world flows through me. I am securely in the flow of prosperity when I receive graciously and gratefully 
and share my abundance generously. Whatever I share with a loving, giving heart blesses me as much as it blesses the one who receives it. Each time I share of my supply, I am demons have what I need. When I share of myself, I am living my faith that I am a divine being empowered with a limitless supply of divine ideas. The richness of an abundant universe flows through me. Knowing this, I don't hesitate to be generous so others will know the abundance of the world as I know it. Through my giving, may they also know the blessings of the awesome power and grace of God as they bless me daily. And from the scriptures, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed us on us by God. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 12. to the wisdom of the many paths to the sacred, we read from three sacred traditions on this morning's topic, facing our own mortality. From Islam, every breath you take is a step towards death. From African traditional religions, we are on a market trip on earth, whether we fill our baskets or not, once the time is up, we go home. And from Judaism and Christianity, Lord, let me know my end, and what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting my life is. Psalms chapter 39, verse 4. For 25 years she's had the same job She's never late She likes her boss And just like that They're letting her go She drives home Drops her mail on the floor Tries to define her place in the world and just like that, she's not sure anymore. Lean into the good to
just like that. She's clearing out closets, sorting her life. She finds a crate with her paintings inside, and just like that, she makes a call. She gets a loan. She opens a shop. They're buying her work. She's selling her art. Just like that. Just like that. Lean into the good times. Breathe through the pain. Learn what you can. Throw the rest away. Changes will come at the drop of a hat. And it's funny how life is. Just like that, she smiles and she says, "All that gloom and doom was really just life making alarm y'all but there is a pooch in the house <laughs> and it was Cute. looking at me when I was singing <laughs> she right he he, <laughs> he like well, that's good but did he like my singing <laughs> he's very cute <laughs> I wasn't expecting that when I looked up and saw this furry face oh goodness I don't know where to put everything. You know, you know what my greatest wish in life is? <laughs> a lectern with a with a shelf. Put my coffee in there. No. All right, this is not going to work. <laughs> well, I hope you had a chance to see our beautiful Day of the Dead altar when you came in. And it was a number of years ago. I'm thinking probably it's been at least 10. I'd have to kind of I don't know, you go back and look at pictures or something, but that I, that I began introducing our community to the Mexican practice of Day of the Dead. It was a tradition that I had long been fascinated by, beginning when I was living in Mexico in my early 20s, and I had the opportunity to see how that holiday was practiced firsthand. And I don't remember exactly what it was that prompted me to first introduce it to our community all those years ago, you, I don't remember. Some, I, you asked me to talk, maybe you asked me to talk about it or something. I don't remember. But it has turned into um, a tradition every year. And um, a tradition of spending at least part or sometimes all of the month of October talking about the many themes and issues around the topic of death and dying. So this has become sort of a tradition and part of our annual um, uh, practices. Now, over the years, as we've looked at these topics, we've used a number of wonderful books that have helped us expand and shift our understanding of death 
and our feelings about it. Um, the one that comes to my mind off the top of my head is The Five Invitations by Frank Ostaseski, a wonderful book. Um, we had a death cafe one year where we gathered over um, goodies and gave ourselves permission to talk openly about our feelings about death. We've, in the past, have incorporated practical and educational events into this month, such as uh, we had an estate planning workshop about, ooh, four, five, ugh, time is like losing its, I'm losing my sense of time these days. Um, we, we had a workshop um, on advanced care directives and end-of-life planning, which was very eye-opening. And then we've always done an arts and crafts night, so we've um, painted ceramics. We made skull masks. We've watched the movie Coco a number of times. And we even tried roasted grasshoppers from Oaxaca. <laughs> and every year we've built a traditional Day of the Dead altar um, and created a powerful tradition of remembering and honoring our loved ones with a special ceremony that we always hold on the Sunday closest to Day of the Dead. So each year, as the long, warm days of summer are turning, turning, you know, the turning of the seasons and um, slipping away of summer and the beginning of fall, I start to consider how I might approach this topic in a new way or with a new source each year, looking for resources that I think will be helpful for all of us as we um, look at this sort of uncomfortable topic. Now, please understand that this is not a topic that I am particularly comfortable with myself, okay? So if talking about death makes you uncomfortable, you're not alone. But somehow, despite my discomfort around it, for some reason I have felt this call to hold this space for our community each year in October for us to explore this topic together topic is sometimes frightening, but ultimately, I think, so incredibly important. Now, there's never a wrong time to talk about death, because death is something that is always present for all of us, whether we are aware of it or not, whether we like it or not. It's something that touches each and every one of us. And despite our discomfort with it, death really lives alongside of us. But it's an especially uh, timely topic for me this year. We have, we have a geriatric pet household. We've got two older cats that, especially the one who is 18, she's my baby girl, and we hope we have you know, some more months or years with her, but you know, we don't know, and it's obvious that you know, she's, she's getting towards the end, um, taking multiple medications and eating special food and all of that. We have a dog that we just adore who's at least 15. We don't know exactly. And again, we hope we have more time with him. But every day I'm aware that, ew, <laughs> that our time with him is limited and that, you know, that day is going to come one day soon. Now, I know there are a lot of pet lovers in here. And besides giving us that unconditional love and companionship that they do every day, our pets are really... Um, can be really important teachers to us about death and dying because their lives are so short, right? So in our own lives, we may have a handful of deaths of those closest to us that really affect us. But if we're pet lovers, time, right? Because their lives are so short compared to us. And so they can be really important teachers for us when it comes to death and um, letting go and grief and coming to terms with the impermanence of life. In my own life also, my own mother just recently celebrated her 80th birthday, and gratefully she appears to be in good health, but we're starting to need to have some of those difficult conversations, you know, about what she wants the next 10 to 15 years of her life to look like, where she wants to live where she wants to go when she can't manage the stairs in her home anymore, and how she wants to spend her money, and uh, what she wants her death to be like. So I know many of you are probably having similar conversations, either about your loved ones or even about yourself. And as the mother of a special needs child who will 
not likely ever be able to be independent, I have to think about my own debt. And it's not fun. It's not something I enjoy. But I would not be, I would be remiss as a parent if I didn't look at it enough to make the plans to provide for my son. And I have done some of that, but it's still a very difficult um, thing for me to even want to deal with. We all go through each and every day as if we're going to live forever, right? I mean, we just do. <laughs> it's human nature. So this death is a topic that touches all of us, and it's probably safe to say that it makes all of us uncomfortable to one extent or another. Thinking about death and talking about death forces us to confront things that we would probably rather put off or look away from, not pay attention to. So it's not always particularly fun, but part of the idea of um, incorporating Day of the Dead into this annual discussion is to bring some levity and that a little bit of that playfulness that the Mexican perspective of death brings. And that can help us to just lighten it up a little bit. And we find, I have found that the Mexican perspective of death and Day of the Dead has so much to teach me about how I conceive of death and how I approach death and how I talk about death. So there, as uncomfortable as it is, there are so many benefits to us facing our fears, overcoming that taboo of talking about death and the discomfort and trying to get more comfortable with talking about it. So even though it's uncomfortable, this is why I believe in doing it together. That's why we approach this together as a community. Because when it comes to our mortality, we are literally all in the same boat, right? Like it or not, we will all die eventually. And we know this is the one great constant in life. So we can approach this difficult topic together with one another, knowing that we all share the same human concerns and fears. And realizing that death is a reality that we all share can help us to feel less alone about it and make it just a little bit less um, frightening. A lot of spiritual traditions have practices that support a greater level of awareness and comfort around death. For example, the Buddhists have a practice of meditating on one's own death. Now, this might seem morbid to our Western sensibilities, but you can start to see that there can be some real benefits. Being aware of our own mortality can help us to become more aware of the fleetingness of life and therefore the preciousness of life. It can force us to confront issues that we would rather postpone or not deal with, ignore. It can give us a greater sense of our own priorities. What's most important to us in life? What really matters to us? And being, in, being conscious that this incarnation value the time that we do have, right? To live each day to the fullest and to savor each and every day as if it were our last. So getting past the discomfort of talking about death has some real benefits for us. Now, why do we do it this time of year? I mean, obviously there's Halloween and Day of the Dead sort of puts us in the mood, right? But why do these holidays even come this time of year? Well, it, it seems to me that it has to do with our connection to the earth itself and the way our own human existence is really inextricably intertwined with the seasons and the changing of the seasons of the planet that we live on. Cultures around the world, going back to ancient times, had celebrations and rituals that took place this time of year. In the northern hemisphere, as we know, fall is the time of harvest, right? So it's the culmination of all that has been put into growing crops to sustain life. And we know that the ancients worked tirelessly throughout the summer and fall to bring in the harvest. And then when that was done, they celebrated and they gave thanks. Now also, fall has like this built-in nature's lesson. Do you know what it is? <laughs> when the leaves fall off the tree. Do you remember the book for the fall of Freddie the Leaf? was a book about dying for young people and um, used that metaphor of the leaves falling off the trees. 
And so in the northern hemisphere, again, when the leaves fall off the trees and the seasons change and nature, animals, and humans alike begin to prepare for the coming of winter, this can bring to mind the idea of death and that things are temporary. Now, with modern technology and electric lighting, central heat, etc., it can be really easy for us to get out of sync with the seasons especially in California, <laughs> maybe more so than where my poor dad lives in New England. Now, here in California, we can have Thanksgiving hors d'oeuvres on the patio, <laughs> right, which I've done, I think, every year for I don't know how long. We can eat strawberries in December, and we can pretty much do outdoor activities year-round. So it can be easy to forget that the earth is going through these changes, right? One of the things we do in Church of the Wild is to seek to become more aligned with the earth and the natural world and its processes as a, a part of restoring our natural relationship with nature. And one way that we can do this is by beginning to pay more attention to the seasons, not just how we're experiencing them, but how the rest of the um, nature is experiencing it, the way that the earth is changing and what is nature doing this time of year. It can help us to feel more connected to nature. So as we know, during the fall, the leaves change color, and this has to do with the amount of daylight and photosynthesis and a bunch of things I don't entirely understand. We also know, well, we maybe don't know, but I'm learning that plants and trees are actually slowing down this time of year as the sunlight decreases because they are getting ready for the colder weather. So their processes are slowing down and changing. Animals are spending these fall months preparing for the coming winter. A lot of birds and butterflies migrate to warmer cli climates. Many mammals spend the autumn months storing up fat to sustain them through the winter. They're growing their winter coats. You may have noticed your cat or dog getting a winter coat. <laughs> And many animals start to seek shelter to protect themselves from the cold. And frankly, I think the really lucky animals, I dream to be a bear. I'll see you in the spring. <laughs> so we can acknowledge the changing seasons and the many ways that all of these animals and plants and birds and insects are experiencing these changes. And in that way, also acknowledge our own connection to the seasons and the ways that we are experiencing these changes as well. We might notice that the dusk is coming a little bit earlier each day, right? Or that the mornings are becoming crisp. Sometimes we get it, well, not this week, let's face it. <laughs> but a couple weeks ago, I actually had to turn my heat on in the morning for a couple minutes. Or we might notice, you know, closing the window at night, putting an extra blanket on the bed. And being mindful of these changes can help connect us to nature as we try to get a little bit more in rhythm with the natural world. And we can allow nature to teach us a lot of really valuable lessons about becoming more comfortable with change. I mean, do you think that the trees get all upset about the leaves falling off? They just know that it's part of the cycle, right? So getting more comfortable with change, letting go of that which is no longer needed in order to make room for that which is seeking to emerge, right? And also teaching us about the fundamental truth that everything dies, but that life itself is eternal. So this year I've chosen the book A Year to Live by Stephen Levine. How to Live This Year as If It Were Your Last. And we'll be using this to guide our exploration of death. It's not necessary to purchase the book, but I try to pick ones that I think would be worthwhile in case you want to purchase it and go deeper. So he begins the book with this passage. This is a book of renewal. It is not simply about dying, but about the restoration of the heart which occurs when we confront our life and death with mercy and awareness. It's an opportunity, this book, to resolve our denial of death as well as our denial of life in an experiment in healing, joy, and revitalization. 
So that, that first passage sold me because it shows how building our understanding and awareness of death and of our own mortality can actually lead us to a fuller life. Okay, and so I love that because that's what, that's what talking about death is all about. Death as a portal to life, which sounds like an oxymoron or a paradox, but if we think about it, life and death are two sides of the same coin, right? So if we ignore one, we limit our experience of the other. Just as if we ignore pain, we limit our experience of joy. It's just the nature of the world that we have. So in a sort of seemingly paradoxical way, exploring our experience of death can lead us to a greater experience of life. Now, over the years of exploring this topic, I've read a number of books about death and dying. And interestingly, maybe it's the kind of books that I pick, but they all seem to be saying very similar things. And the main point, or one of the main points, seems to be that if we go through life acting as if we will never die, essentially denying our own mortality, death will come for us one day, and it will catch us unaware. Now, if we're lucky, our death won't be sudden, and there will still be time to prepare for it. But, undoubtedly for some of us, death will be sudden, and there won't be time to prepare. So we need to not wait to ponder our own death, to think about what things need to be wrapped up or taken care of in our lives, what things need to be let go of in order that we might die in peace were we to die today. And we need to not wait to do the things we want to do in life. We need to not postpone or put off living our joy, following our passions, finding our life's purpose, working through that bucket list of things we want to do and experience in life. We need to not wait because if we do, we may find that it is too late. And we need to not wait to prepare for death because the time to prepare for death is now. But in order to do this, we have to overcome some pretty strong cultural taboos on talking about death. And we have to overcome our own aversion to admitting our own mortality. Sometimes we might even get superstitious and think that if we talk about death or think about death, we're somehow going to make it happen. That ever occurred to anybody? Like, oh no, don't want to talk about it. We don't want to, like, you know, don't want to encourage it, <laughs> right? But talking about death will not make death come any sooner. Death comes when it comes. And it's better for us to be as prepared as possible to greet it with as much grace and dignity and peace as possible. So the book's subtitle, How to Live This Year as If It Were Your Last, is the author's experiment where he spent a year trying to get into that mindset and living as if it were his last year. And so the book prompts us to think about how would we live if we knew we only had a year to live. Now you can tinker with that time frame if you need to. You could say six months or even six weeks with your remaining time? These are really great questions for us to ponder because they help us clarify what's most important to us. If we knew we only had a year to live, what would we let go of? That thing that we've been hanging on to, we all have it. I have it. (laughs) You know? And if I knew I only had a year to live, I might let go of it. What business would we take care of if we knew we only had a year left? What unfinished business, what, you know, loose strings, what things, you know, emotional things, spiritual material, whatever it is, what things would we say to our loved ones and to our friends? And what experiences would we want to have? Now, in all the books I've read, I've heard it repeated over and over again. When people are on their deathbed, they never say they wish they had worked more. 
They never say they wish they had made more money or bought more cars or had a bigger house. They just don't. But many people on their deathbed do report having certain regrets, and we can learn from this. People report regretting not spending more time with loved ones. They regret not focusing on their relationships. They regret not having found their true passion or having engaged in meaningful work. They regret leaving business unfinished. And in the book, Levine reports that many people wish they had placed more importance on their spiritual growth. So we're in good shape when it comes to that, right? (laughs) Because we do focus on our spiritual growth, but so many people think, well, I'll do that later when I have time. Right now, I'm trying to get ahead, or I'm trying to succeed, or I'm trying to make money. And many people wish that they had paid more attention to cultivating and experiencing authentic joy in their lives. Now, he explains, and he has sat with, you know, hundreds of people as they were dying, that so many people, when they're given a terminal diagnosis or told that they only have, you know, six months or a year or whatever to live, after they get over the initial shock of that news, many people report feeling a huge burden lifted from them. They feel something opening up inside them and a sense of spaciousness growing within them. And ironically, after being given a terminal diagnosis, many people feel suddenly free to start living. And some people have reported feeling that finally and completely their life is their own to live as they wish. So what if we didn't have to wait until we got a terminal diagnosis to experience that? What if we could work with an awareness of our own death in order to see if we can create that same sense or at least, uh, you know, uh, something like that sense of spaciousness and freedom and our life being our own without having to get the terminal diagnosis? What if we could get at that sense of living each day as if it were our last, living life to the fullest. And what if we could learn from those who report feeling regret on their deathbed when they realize that they have not utilized their time on earth as they wish they had? We can learn from those reports so that we don't make the same mistakes. Immediacy, a sense of life's fleetingness, and the preciousness of each and every day. If we could get even a little bit into that mindset, how would we live? What would we do differently? What would be important to us? So this is what we want to consider as we explore our own mortality. Getting some clarity about what matters most to us. What we've been putting off for later that we could maybe make a start of now. And we want to take this knowledge that our own death is inevitable and use it to live life more fully. So again, getting back to the nature, the lessons that we can learn from nature as we move into this autumn season and as we watch the leaves turning color and beginning to fall off of the trees and as we begin to practice intentionally becoming more mindfully aware of how the natural world around us is changing with the seasons and how we are changing as well. So I want to offer you this perspective, which comes from a beautiful essay by Asia Suler, and it's called Autumn is the Dying. Bless you. A time of harvest and longing, celebrations, endings, and melancholy, autumn is a potent mixture of all the exquisite fulfillment and color that accompanies the ritual of dying. It reminds us that dying is, in truth, a time of the deepest abundance and celebratory release. Blush-colored apples and pumpkins left glowing like lanterns in vine-withered fields, gourds and sunflower seeds, cracked black walnuts and hickory nut milk, hearty chestnut cakes, and food literally falling from the sky. 
as we lose everything from the crown of the trees down to the weeds, our forest floors fill with nourishment. Our tables are heaped, our pantries plentifully lined, and we are left with nothing but thanksgiving and the luxurious space to wean ourselves off of that which actually robs our sustenance, to let the aspects of our life that aren't feeding us die. And this, after all, is the beautiful truth of dying, that if we can see beyond the waning and our own fear of ending, we will notice that the burial ground itself is one of abundance and a feast of great fullness is what awaits us on the other side. So it is with this beautiful nature-based way of seeing death that I hope we can approach this topic together, allowing nature to teach us how to let go, to show us how to release ourselves from that which no longer serves us, that which robs us of our sustenance knowing that as we let go, a feast of great fullness is what is waiting for us on the other side. getting comfortable now and preparing for some time of quiet, allowing the body to become still, relaxing through the body, seeing if you can ah, just let the shoulders fall away from the ears, let your hands rest gently in your lap, unclenching the jaw. Just allowing a wave of relaxation to come through your body, feeling it ground you in the pew beneath you, your feet planted on the floor, feeling that stability, that sureness, that safety. And beginning by finding an awareness of your breath allowing the breath to be slower and deeper as you breathe in deeply into the belly. And exhale slowly, sighing it out. Taking another deep breath into the belly. And just sigh it out. <sighs> Feeling the way the body responds to that deep breath slowing the heart rate, bringing some peace and relaxation and quiet. And as the body quiets and relaxes, the mind follows. So just allowing the thoughts that are going through your mind to just pass through. You can pick them up later if you need to. Right now, just rest your attention on your breath. 
on the sounds around you, on the sensations in your body. And in this place of calm and receptivity, you might begin to ask yourself, what if I lived? What would that feel like? What would I want to do with the time left? Ask yourself what is most important to you. And whatever it is, don't judge the answer that comes up. Just listen. What is most important? Are there things that you still so want to do? Is there a passion that you want to explore? Are there people you have unfinished business with? What would you need to do or take care of so that you might approach your death with peace? With a feeling of completion? With a feeling of acceptance? How might you live your life? And now as you rest for a few moments, allow any ideas, things that you want to remember, commitments you want to make to yourself of things that you want to do or take care of, just allow those to bubble up as you rest for a few moments in the silence. prepare now to bring this time to a close, just making a mental note of that which we want to remember from this time, maybe a commitment we've made to ourselves to take care of something, or an idea of life in whatever remaining time we have. And so we give thanks for this opportunity to explore this topic. We give thanks for these teachings, and we give thanks for this community which supports us in our spiritual growth. And we say thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And so it is. Amen.
Unity of Monterey Bay is the collective consciousness and commitment of all of us who give of our time, treasure, and talent in order to sustain the spiritual community that is dedicated to transforming lives. We know that prosperity is a state of mind that finds blessings in every situation and abundance in joyous generosity. We transform all appearance of fear or lack into a faith-filled peace of mind by shifting our attention to thoughts of gratitude for the abundance of God's good in our lives. As the ushers please now come forward, I invite you to think of something specific that you are grateful for in this now moment. And now, with our hearts and minds overflowing with gratitude, we breathe into the divine flow of God's good, trusting that we are enough, and that we have enough, and that there always is enough to both have and to share. For those of you who give online through our website, have set up monthly auto payments from your bank, or give by credit card, we are truly grateful, and ask that you join us in faith and gratitude as we pass the offering baskets this morning by holding and blessing the basket as it passes by you. And now, please join me in our draftatory blessing. I am an open channel for God's infinite good. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies everything I give and everything I receive. I am both blessed and a blessing. Thank you, God. Nothing is ever lost, and we are not forgotten. We are living in the heart of God. Nothing is ever lost, and we are not forgotten. We are living in the heart of God. We are living, we are living, we are living heart of God. We are living, we are living, we are living in the heart of God. Morning sun coming through the trees and the green leaves shimmer in the summer breeze. The songbirds singing to the honey bees, living in the heart of God. We are living, we are living, we are living in the heart of God. We are living, we are living, we are living in the heart of God. After the dazzle of day is done And the moon makes love to the setting sun The stars come twinkling one by one Living in the heart of God We are living, we are living We are living in the heart living in the heart of God. 
living in the heart of God. We are living, we are living, we are living in the heart of God. We are living in the heart of God. We are living in the heart of God. Nothing is ever lost, and we are not forgotten. I see that dog again. He is so cute. <laughs> I'm going to have to get my hands on him. Can I kiss him? Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, so it is with great joy that we bless and give thanks for these gifts and offerings that demonstrate our collective commitment to the spiritual work of love and transformation in our lives and in our world. And we dedicate this offering, our lives, and this ministry to more fully expressing the Christ light that is the truth of our being and inviting all people to know God's love. Finally, knowing that one with God all things are possible, we affirm together that the good is now, the rest is blessed, and the best is yet to be in our lifetime. Gently. Thank you. And so we want to thank Jan Garrett and J.D. Martin, Carol Huntley and Karen Drucker, Denise Rosier, and Kenny Loggin for this morning's music. Mm -hmm. as well as our awesome music team led by Denise with John on drums and Michelle, Michelle, that's me, Robin and, <laughs> <who's Michelle? laughs> Robin and Michelle <laughs> on vocals. <laughs> oh boy. So for announcements, we invite you to check your e-blast. But as um, you know, there are a number of activities coming up for Days of the Dead. Um, the altar is up, so you are welcome to begin bringing in your um, photographs or other mementos that you would like to share on our communal altar. Um, and then, is it this Friday? It's this coming Friday, right? Is our, um, okay, how many people, have, okay, well, let me ask it like this. How many people have not seen the movie Coco? I have not. <laughs> you have not? And you, and you still are here? Alive? Okay, but most of you have seen it. Okay, so I need to talk with the twins because, like, they're the main kids that come. Unless I don't know if Jessona is going to be bringing her kids, but um, every year we kind of negotiate with the. But we haven't watched it in a few years, and I would love for us to watch Coco again. And whether you've seen it or haven't seen it, you are welcome to come. I can't. I can't guarantee right now that that's going to be the movie, but I'm hoping I can convince them. <laughs> I watch it every year. It's just the kind of movie that I watch every year, and I never get tired of it. It's beautiful. And we're going to have pizza, and we're also going to be doing some crafts. So adults are perfectly welcome to join. I think that I put 530. Yeah. If you're not interested in the craft, you might come just a little later, 630 maybe, probably around the time we'd be starting the movie. So anyway, all are welcome. All right. We have, okay, so an error was made on um, Pat's, name on her, um, sorry, her name and her email. So we've corrected that and corrected directories are available in the back. If you've already picked up your um, directory and have it at home, pick up a sticker. Vicki made little stickers you can just take. It's got Patty's name on it correctly and her, her email correctly and you can just go home and stick it over your thing. So yeah, just because if you tried to email her, the T is missing, it obviously won't get to her. So okay, and we apologize for that. Is that it? Anything else? And Vicki has a new script. <laughs> and I'm so glad I'm not the one that had to go through that. <laughs> oh, Lord. So as we bring our service to a close this morning, we are just so grateful that you have joined us, whether you're here in person or you're joining us um, on Facebook Live or watching later on YouTube. We hope that we've made you feel part of our community, and we want you to know that wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Our chaplain on duty today is Ms. Robin. Is a, this, Larry. Oh, I thought you were holding it. Larry. Larry, sorry. Larry is available to pray with you after the service. So we give thanks for that. All right, we're ready to form our closing circle for our prayer for protection and our peace song. You 
just stay in the middle. We just surround you. <laughs> oh, God. What do you even say about that? Anything I say is in a fantasy story. Ah, oh, so as we form this circle of love and prayerfulness, I invite us all to just hold those places in the world today that are experiencing war and terror and all kinds of horrific things in the Middle East. Just holding that part of the world, just imagining it being held in this circle and just sending it love, sending it peace lifting it up in God's presence, seeing divine order being established in and through the situation, and God's infinite love surrounding all the people, especially the children, and continuing to hold them in our hearts as we say our prayer for protection. The light of God God surrounds surrounds us. us. I am light. The The love of God God enfolds us. us. I I am love. The The power of God protects us. I (laughs) am power. The The presence presence of God God watches over us. us. I I am presence. presence. Wherever we are, God is.